Hello, today I'm going to look at some Roman pottery. Um, the Roman period is always one that's very popular with the public and with historians, even if you don't know much about history. Um, when people say it's Roman at once, it's old and interesting. Um, and even if you've just seen Gladiator for the fifth time, there's still some fascination about the Roman period. Um, and it's great, I always enjoy finding bits of Roman pottery along the Thames when I go mudlarking. Um, it's a huge field, obviously the Roman Empire lasted for about a thousand years altogether um, and they were in control of Britain um, from 43 to about 410, although they had influence before and after with imports. Um, so Roman pottery production for the 400 years of Roman Britain uh, is a vast subject and quite complicated so what I'm just going to do is run for a few items that you might be quite likely to find on the foreshore. Um, Roman remains and pottery can turn up anywhere along the foreshore due to all the reclamation and dumping that's gone on throughout the years and the centuries. Um, there are hot spots where you're more likely to find bits of Roman than elsewhere but um, we'll just run through and we'll start like all good archaeological reports with the Samian. Um, this is a uh, very highly prized in the Roman period, uh, tableware. It's got a red slip uh, and it's normally very high quality. Um, the first Samian that was imported into this country came from Italy um, in the first century, um, but that's not so commonly found. Normally what you'd find on the foreshore would be what they call Gaulish Samian from Gaul. Uh, and in Roman terms, Gaul included Germany. So um, from the first century and the second century, you get factories uh, producing huge quantities of Samian in France. Um, and later, in the early third century, that would be transferred to Germany around Trier and that sort of region. Um, so Samian was imported right from the um, early days of the Roman Empire in Britain. Um, up to about 230 AD uh, when the production was interrupted um, and the problems with transportation. Um, and uh, also it was a little Samian was produced in this country in Colchester for a short period but there were other factories in this country that would make imitations of Samian vessels. Uh, they were very highly prized as I said and when they were broken they were even repaired rather than thrown away. That's how much their owners valued them. Um, so as I said, the, the Samian pottery uh, is a red body with a red slip, not a red glaze fired on. Uh, very, very rarely is pottery glazed uh, in the Roman period, um, but it's quite a distinctive and nice finish there. So even when it's worn, uh, like that piece I picked up on the foreshore, it's quite a distinctive colour and look to it, so you should start to recognise it and differentiate it from a flower pot or something else that is that colour. Um, yeah, this I'm a bit of a bit of a fraud really because this rather nice base um, I didn't find in the Thames. Someone did, but not me. Um, I got it many many years ago from a wonderful. Uh, flea market there used to be under the arches at Charing Cross Station and I picked that up for a pound in the 1980s and I wish I'd had more money when I was younger to buy some great stuff, there was some great stuff on offer. Um, Samian normally has a maker's mark in the base there. Uh, this one is just a jumbled series of lines, it doesn't actually spell out a legible name which happened later. Um, earlier on, I uh, hope you can see that, these stamps were very clear and often they would end with an F. So you'd have the person's name, like Cinemus F, F for fake it, which means made it in Latin. Um, plain Samian, but also decorated Samian. Uh, it's one of my best finds, and I picked that up on the foreshore. It was just lying there. A beautiful archer with a palm tree behind him. He's probably on a hunt. I guess he's probably hunting lions somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and you can see above that you've got that sort of egg-shaped decoration, that's called an overlow, um, and that's very common on Samian pieces. So if you see something like that, uh, you know you're talking about Roman Samian there. The um, figures were produced 
um, with moulds and they were pressed onto the clay to make uh, that sort of moulded decoration, so quite nice. Um, from one end of the scale to the other, um, from Samian, which was highly prized and you know as much as silver or metalware in those days, um, down to the other end of the spectrum, the humble greyware, which is also incredibly common throughout the Roman period and was basically produced through the whole um, time period of Roman Britain. Um, but this is much more utilitarian ware, uh, domestic ware, storage, pots and vases, and some cooking ware as well. Um, as I say, very, very common, commonly found on Roman sites and commonly found in London. Um, also grey ware was produced in the medieval period, uh, but one sure way of telling whether it's Roman or medieval grey ware is um, the rim. The rim of Roman pots are normally rounded. Uh, that's from a storage jar, so the rim sits like that, and then the jar has a body going around like that. Um, so the Roman rims are normally rounded, uh, and if you find Roman uh, a greyware with a rounded rim, then you're normally talking a Roman piece, obviously not glazed. Again, some of them are burnished, which has a polished black slip on it in zones, so you can see a line where there's a burnished part which is shiny and a non-burnished which is not shiny. Uh, and um, a slip, sometimes the outside will be slipped with a grey slip or a black slip. Uh, so round there, that's quite distinctively Roman, uh, just that round just below the rim, uh, but I suppose where you could grip onto your pot and carry it around. Um, also, um, you do get on some pieces a rather sort of metallic sheen there, I hope you can see that. Uh, which comes from the firing of the Roman greyware pottery and that's also quite distinctive and you've got that round rim there as well. Um, a lot of Roman greyware which was used in London came from the Alice Holt Industries which are just outside Farnham uh, and I only live 15 minutes away from there so I've been along to the kiln sites and poked around a bit and you can pick up loads of bits of greyware so it's quite distinctive and it was a huge industry throughout the Roman period and they produced industrial quantities of greyware to supply the South East and London. So they're quite common, you can pick them up along the Thames and hopefully you'll be able to spot those a bit more now. Um, there were decorated greywares as well, occasionally, finer wares. Um, this rather nice piece, you can see it's got a cross hatching there uh, and that's a very typical Roman decorative motif. Um, often when you find them they're quite worn, so they're quite faint and sometimes you can only just sort of spot the, the cross hatching if you turn it different ways in the light. Um, again, this piece is not all that it seems. Um, I picked this up on the foreshore, a very low tide, uh, and was quite excited to find it. Um, but interestingly, along the edges it's got some very un-Roman uh, sticky gum glue on it. So what I reckon this is, is probably uh, some Victorian antiquarian has stuck this together um, or attempted to stick it together and then somehow it's been thrown away uh, and ended up in the Thames so it may not even be from Roman London it could have pick, been picked up anywhere but it's obviously been uh, glued together at some time which is not a very Roman thing at all. Um, here's another bit of Alice Holtware with some very nice bands of decoration, wavy lines and hatching done by hand. Uh, that's quite distinctive Roman decorative motifs there. Um, this would be a later piece, um, probably that's going to be 4th century, I think that bit of Alice Holt uh, greyware there, but nice to have found that. Um, Another common type of pottery was the flagon, which was just a wine jug or a drinking container. Um, and they're quite distinctive, especially the uh, rims and the necks of those, um, a sort of bulbous body with a long neck. Um, I haven't actually got any large pieces to show you, um, so I'll pop a few pictures up at the end of this. Uh, there's 
the ring from the rim, the top of a flagon. Um, flagons, 1st century and 2nd century, very common and very widely used, so you will pick those up along the foreshore occasionally. Uh, but I'll pop a few pictures up so that you can see what you're looking for there, and hopefully you'll have more luck than I have in the flagon department. Um, another very distinctive Roman form, which um, was not used later at all, uh, is the mortaria. Um, mortarium plural, mortaria, uh, mortaria singular, <laughs> mortarium singular, and mortaria plural. So mortaria would be a group um, of objects. And these large, hefty clay vessels um, with grits inside uh, used in Roman cooking. Uh, Romans loved uh, food with oil and herbs and pastes and they would mix these up, I suppose it's like a sort of pestle really, and grind it on the grits on the inside uh, and then pour it uh, when you've made your oil or your dressing um, out of a spout. Uh, here's a picture of a complete mortarium, um, so you can see what it looks like. Um, and because some of them were huge, um, I guess probably for cooking um, for larger amounts of people, they tend to survive quite well. So what they normally have is a wide rim, sometimes with uh, a rounded, as usual, an obvious flange on it because you'd need to get your hand in and grip it tightly while you're doing your grinding um, of your sauces. Um, there's a good example there. So that's the rim of a mortarium and with an obvious rounded flange there. And, and um, there is a dating uh, sequence for those, you know, so you get an idea of, of the shape of the rim when it was made. Um, as I said, there, there are grits in them, um, but unlike other gritty pottery, they're only on one side. So this is a classic example uh, of a mortaria fragment. So absolutely no grits on the outside but the inside very gritty and that's where they would mix their sauces on. Um, and even on the rim bits uh, you can see one or two grits have crept up there. Uh, there's a big grit there. Um, that's quite a good example there. So you can see just at the top there uh, the grits are just starting uh, in the body of the vessel there. Um, and there's a spout. Quite a nice big one from a large mortaria for pouring out your Roman cooking. Oh, I forgot to say, with um, the greyware, the bases often have rings around them like that. Uh, and when they were finished with or broken, they were obvious uh, vessels for using the bases to make counters. So that's the base of a greyware slip vessel and um, someone's just smoothed it off there to make a counter for a Roman game. Uh, I think they've scratched a little mark on it, maybe a V perhaps for five. That's nice. Um, Fine wares during the Roman period, um, table wares made of pottery that weren't Samian. Um, again, these are very popular, and again, the defining identification for them is that they're slipped or colour coated, they're called. So the clay is coated in liquid clay um, of a similar colour or a contrasting colour and then fired like that. Um, it's not a glaze, so it does wear very obviously and over the high points of a vessel um, it's quite distinctive. So I'll show a few of you, show um, a few of these to you now. Um, lots of factories produced colour-coated wares and slipped pottery um, in Cologne, uh, in Germany or Gaul 
um, it was known in those days. Uh, they produced uh, black colour-coated wares, uh, and there's an example of that. Um, from about 150 to 250 AD, um, but they also um, copied them in this country, so you get the made at Colchester, uh, in the Neen Valley, in Oxfordshire, and other places. Um, let's just run through a few fragments. Um, a very common type of vessel was the hunt cup, uh, which just basically had animals uh, chasing each other, dogs chasing stags or rabbits or hares around the body of the vessel. Um, there's a picture of a complete one so you can see what I'm talking about. And there you can see that the slip has worn off, so you can see the colour of the clay through uh, the slip there. Um, and obviously they, they had a lot of series of dots as decoration as well, and invariably the slip has worn away from the top of those, so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Um, and even in a very worn piece, it's quite distinctive, the colour coat. A contrasting colour inside there. Um, again that rouletted decoration, cross-hatching there. Sorry, uh, rouletting, not cross-hatching. Um, and there's the the body and neck of an animal. So they're raised up. The, the animals are raised up as raised uh, decoration there. And that's slightly worn on the slip. And there inside you can see the throwing marks as well of the vessel. Um, this is rather nice. This is a dog's head with his ears swept back as he's chasing another animal around the pot uh, there and contrasting colour coat on the inside. Very thin walls. Um, another distinctive feature of Roman pottery generally is how beautifully thin it is. I hope you can see that there. Um, surprisingly thin. So if you find a piece of pottery that thin, you're normally talking about a Roman piece, and that's colour-coated as well. See the way there. So the, the wonderful thing about the Romans is that they were so expert uh, in lots of ways, in engineering, um, in their financial organisation and um, technology really, that, that it took Europe about a thousand years, or fifteen hundred years in some cases, to recover the techniques that the Romans used and certainly pottery as fine as the Romans produced really didn't come into widespread um, availability until the Industrial Revolution and people like Wedgwood. Um, here's another few bits of colour coated you can see there the rouletted decoration very distinctively Roman on that piece and again on that piece there Um, towards the end of the Roman Empire, in the uh, 4th century, um, I said earlier in the Roman Empire, black slip was common. Um, you see red or brown slip um, produced in Oxfordshire quite often. Um, towards the end of the Roman Empire, uh, there's an example there of some brown colour-coated ware. That's quite a nice large piece. Uh, and that, rather worn, um, but it is brown colour coated uh, with some decoration on it. So that's nice uh, chevrons there. So that would be a 4th century piece. Um, something which is not uh, colour coated Roman pottery, but looks quite Roman because they were imitating the Roman style, uh, is the black basalts range of Worcester pottery which is 18th century and you can see there they have got that sort of rouletted style decoration the difference is being this is machine cut into the clay and it is glazed with a very um, fused black glaze but they were imitating Roman styles of pottery there in the classical revival but if you put two pieces together the Roman here and the Worcester hopefully you can see the Worcester doesn't have any um, of the glaze or slip worn through so you can see the body colour and of course 
the, the Worcester is black all the way through and the Roman has a white body, sometimes a pinkish red body. So hopefully after a while you can distinguish the two. Lots of people pick these up and think they are Roman and they certainly look Roman. Um, but of course they are not Roman. Um, and there's another couple examples there. So hopefully this is the Worcester, black basalts, this is the Roman. And you can see hopefully the difference between the two there. Um, another um, similar to the colour-coated wares uh, was made at Trier um, and these are black slipped um, pottery but they've got a white slip trail they call that barbotine decoration it's just trailed slip but it's actually very thick it comes proud of the pottery several millimetres um, and they would make slip trailed decoration there in white on a black background um, and often they would spell out words on a pot like bibe which means drink which is a suitable motto for a drinking cup. Um, I've just found a little bit there, and that's quite distinctive. Um, again, that would be a uh, second or early third century for that piece. Okay, just a couple of pieces which I've only found one example of. Um, this, hopefully you can see the surface of that. Um, this is very, very thin fine wear, black, very burnished surfaces um, and also there's just a trace, I picked it up because it was thin and black so I thought it was Roman but when I washed it I realised that it had painted decoration on it in a very similar colour to the glaze, you can just see that decoration. I think this is terra nigra uh, which just means black earth uh, and it's uh, first century pottery, a fine pottery which was made in northern Gaul and was imported to the province of Britannia. Um, so that's beautiful, very, very finely made. Um, another little bit, which I've only found one piece of, which is quite distinctively Roman. Um, well, firstly, the shape. You can see it's got that dish in it, in the side. Uh, and that would be like a, a beaker, and it would have those impressions all the way round the pot. You can see the rim at the top. Um, and that was a style of shape which was frequently used in many different Roman pottery fabrics, uh, including Samian, and quite distinctive. Uh, you can see the surface is, is very sort of, well, it's covered in small pieces of clay to make that sort of rough surface. It's called rough castware. Um, and again, that's quite Roman, uh, nothing on the inside, very smooth, but just given that decorative feature of having little pellets of clay sprinkled on the surface there and with a brown colour coat. Um, just to run through quickly then some of the more obvious Roman pottery decorations which are quite distinctive. Um, we looked at the cross hatching and moulded decoration there that stands proud of the surface. Uh, slip trailing there is quite common. And rouletting of one type or another by hand, very common in the Roman period. And then bands of decoration of different styles, geometric styles there, or chevrons. Again quite distinctively Roman. Um, and a couple which I haven't found examples of, but uh, which are quite distinctively Roman, uh, so I'll just post a few photographs of them. Um, London type ware, which is also early from the first century, had compass drawn decoration of circles uh, and lines on it. So I just here's a few examples, it's very distinctive if you find it. And then also rows of dots, uh, especially round poppy head beakers. If you imagine the shape of uh, an opium poppy uh, flower stem, the bulb at the top, uh, beakers made in that shape, they're called poppy head beakers, and they often have dots, rows of dots going down 
the curved sides of the beakers. So here's a photograph of one of those. Um, so that really sort of finishes off a, a quick look at fine wares. Um, just to finish up with another classic Roman pottery style, that is the amphora. Um, here's the base of an amphora. Uh, again, I take no credit in finding this whatsoever. It certainly didn't come from the Thames, although there are ones found in London frequently. Um, this my mother-in-law found uh, while scuba diving in southern France uh, in the 1960s, and I rescued it from her shed. Um, but it shows you the sort of size and weight of these amphora. They're very thick walled vessels. It was a storage container of choice uh, throughout trade in the Roman Empire, and they would come from Africa, from the Middle East, from Spain, from uh, France, and be imported into this country bearing wine and oils and small uh, seeds and olives and uh, anything they wanted to transport, really. Um, they got this curiously shaped foot, which is very distinctive, and they would have sat. Uh, in rows on the ship uh, or in the warehouse, you know, up against the wall, maybe in sand to hold them. But uh, that is helpful if you want to move something when it was complete. Even the empty ones weighed about 25 kilograms. So they're fairly big and it's obviously full, it'd be even heavier. Um, and in the Roman warehouses, they would just roll that along the floor. So that's quite helpful. Rather than having to lift it, you could just get your friendly slaves to roll them across the floor. Um, to wherever they need to go. Um, I have found that in the Thames, which is uh, one of the top of a handle of an amphora, and there would normally be two handles um, either side of the neck. Um, but they're obviously very chunky bits, very large, uh, and very distinctively Roman. They sometimes had um, a painted label at the top of the amphora, which would say where it came from, who the merchant was, what the contents were, um, and that's great when archaeologists find that. So I hope you've enjoyed this survey of some of the Roman pieces you can find in the Thames and I hope that will encourage you to get out there and find your own Roman pottery. Thanks, bye.